Uh, I'd like you to open your Bible to two places. Two places. I want you to put a bookmark in Exodus 20. Exodus 20. For today, we will be looking at the Ten Commandments. But I want to do a reading from Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Verse 16 to verse 22. Matthew 19, 16 to 22. And then we'll return back to Exodus 20. From verse 16 of Matthew chapter 19. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. For if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the rich, when the the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I uh, want to come back to that passage uh, at the end of the message. Uh, we are about halfway through the book of Exodus. The, uh, the, the second half of the book will not take anywhere near as long as the first half has taken us. This morning I want to talk about the Ten Commandments. Now don't worry, there are not ten points to this sermon. There are only seven. Only seven, that's all. Uh, we looked at the commandments one by one uh, earlier in the year. But I wanted us to look at all of them together uh, as it unfolded in the book of Exodus. Uh, Seven observations about the Ten Commandments. Uh, It's been said that these are the Ten Commandments. They are not the Ten Suggestions. Or Or someone else said, which part of thou shalt not do you not understand? These are God's Commandments. We know from Exodus that they were given on two tables of stone. Two tables of stone. It's generally believed that on the first table were the the Godward commands. Have no other gods. Don't worship graven images. Don't take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. And on the second table, the commandments relating to our relationship with others. On appearance, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet. We have obligations to God which come first. We have obligations to one another which come second. But God must always come first. Uh, Duties usually never really conflict. It would only be in the very rare circumstances that we would have to obey God rather than men. The basis of these commandments is ultimately love. Love. We know that the Ten Commandments can, in a sense, be reduced to two, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus said that on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So let me make a number of observations about the Ten Commandments today with your Bibles open in Exodus chapter 20. The first thing that we can say about the Ten Commandments is that God commands, God commands because he first redeems. He first redeems. Look at verse 1 and 2 of Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of Egypt. Bondage. God appeals to them, not primarily as their creator, but as their redeemer. As their redeemer. Five times in chapter 20, we have the expression, the Lord your God. This 
these commandments were not given to the Egyptians, so to speak, though they have universal application. These, these commandments, by and large, are still observed today across many, many cultures, as we know. But God commands because he first redeemed. The only hope of obedience is through redemption. The only way that sinners, sinners like you and I, can obey the commands of God is to first know him as Lord and Saviour so that we are no longer strangers, but we are children of God, sons and daughters of faith, through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Unless God redeems us, unless we have come to him and entered a relationship with him, we have no hope of obeying the, the commands of God. In 1 John 4, 19, it says we love him because he first loved us. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so our obedience today to the laws of God should arise out of the fact that we know him personally, we know him personally, and we love him. How many people get that back to the front? How many people think, well, I better start obeying God so he can accept me and I'll be good enough. The thing is, friends, we cannot start all over again. And even if we were to try and start all over again, we still have a wicked heart. We, we have a natural bent to sin. A natural bent to sin. That only grace can change. Believers love and obey because we are loved and we have been redeemed. There's another point I want to make about the Ten Commandments today, and that is the way we worship matters to God. The way we worship. And I don't want to restrict worship to just what we do Sunday morning, but it certainly goes beyond that. This is our public worship, you could say our corporate worship, but the way we worship matters to God. Look at verse 3 to verse 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my Commandments, idolatry, strictly forbidden. Even if you can make this incredible image and put the words Jehovah. Can't even do that. Can't even do that. Not even a golden calf. Imagine the incredible sight of a golden calf. This is our guide who has delivered us. Not even that is good enough. To reduce God to an image suggests that he can be controlled or manipulated. Let's, let's move God to this corner of the room. Can't do that. Can't do that. So verse 3 says, don't worship anyone but God. In verse 4, don't worship God the way pagans worship their gods. That's interesting. You can't take pagan means. And say, well, we'll just worship God this way. We'll change the label. Friends, if, if it's poison, if it's poison within, changing the label doesn't change anything. Just makes it more dangerous. We worship a God who, who talks about his jealousy. Now, our jealousy virtually always springs from selfishness. God's jealousy comes out of his holiness. Out of his holiness. He deserves to be worshipped first, to be put first. And, and, and God is not sinning when he is jealous for worship and the glory of his people. Jesus in John 4 talked about a day coming when those who, the true worshippers of God, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He differentiated between false worship and right worship. And so when we worship God, we need to be careful that we seek to honour him and to glorify him. Our sincerity is not enough. It's not enough just to be sincere. 
We need to do all we can to make our worship acceptable to God, which pleases Him. Sincerity isn't enough. And even, even when people try and worship God through pagan means, pagan means, friends, there are great consequences for that. Did you notice verse 5? That God visits the iniquity upon the fathers to the children of the third and fourth generation when God's people turn to paganism. Paganism. Their children, their grandchildren usually are pagans too. They're pagans too. We seek a godly seed that loves God. And so let, let's worship God in spirit and in truth because we are leaving a heritage for our children to follow. They would feel the consequences of false worship. Let me make a third observation about the Ten Commandments today. The name of God, exalted high. Exalted high. Look at verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, or in an empty way, treating the name of God like it's some sort of feather blowing in the wind. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Even, even using God's name, its use was, was regulated and protected. God says, be careful how you use the name. You might have some expensive fine china or fine glassware at home. You're going to protect that. You're going to look after that. You're going to have it out of, out of reach from the grandkids when they come. Revere the name of God. His name reflects his holy character. You cannot take God's name in vain and it not impact what you think of God himself. The name Jesus and God and Lord God knows every time that word, that name is used in vain. God's going to bring to account every word and every action in the secret places. Can you, can you imagine every day on earth how often the name that would save them if they called out in faith is taken in vain? Uh, some, some of you hear the name of God taken in vain each day, each week in different places. Now, this goes beyond someone swearing and, and taking God's name in vain. It means to make a false oath. People swear to truth, the whole truth. No, but the truth, so help me God. They lie. They're taking God's name in vain. Using his name as a joke, twisting his word. When preachers get up and say, thus says the Lord, but God didn't say it. It's taking God's name in vain. Falsely worshipping God. Praying in a selfish, manipulative way. Someone said that the worst blasphemy is not profanity, but lip service. Giving lip service to God. Acts 4.12 says that there's no other name given whereby we must be saved. I trust as God's people we revere the name of Christ. It should grieve us when we hear his name taken in vain. We should use the opportunity at the right time in a gracious way to say, hey, you know that name you mentioned? And they'll have no idea. You know that name? What do you mean? Well, you've mentioned Jesus' name a few times today. Let me tell them about what, what he's done for you. There are many opportunities we can take at, at the right time. Observation number four, look at verse 8 to 11. Not all days are created equal. Now, they're equal in time. <laughs> equal in time, but they're not all the same. Look at verse 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. And, and look who's included. Look who's included. You nor your son, nor your daughter. Well, that makes sense. Give the family a rest. Nor your male servant or female servant. No, you can't make your servants get out and do the extra work. They get a rest. But look, nor your cattle. Give the animals a rest. You can't make the animals go and work while you sit on the veranda. 
nor your stranger, not even some Gentile, someone you picked up on the way. You, they have to have a break. Everyone gets a break. Everyone gets a day of refreshment. Not all days created equal. God has set us, and it, it, it's operative today. We have a seven-day week. We have a seven-day week. And we respond to that. That's how we live. And let me tell you this. God knows how we need to live our lives. He does. Would you believe God knows better than us? Even collectively. God knows better. And God says the way to honour me and to live for me in this world is to follow a seven-day pattern and to have one day of rest. One day of rest. Now I realise we live in a generation of chef workers and casual workers and all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff, right? But this is still in the Bible. It's still in the Bible, so we're going to have to deal with this. We can't get away from it for too long. It's still there, still there. And those who ignore this principle usually are fairly irritable, fairly grumpy, fairly selfish, We're trying to get ahead. They'll walk over people because money is their guide. But but they pay for it in the long term. The long term. Now, of course, in Old Testament times, the Sabbath was a Saturday. It was a Saturday. Even, Even today, some people still insist on a Saturday worship. We know from the resurrection of Jesus that the early church just spontaneously, spontaneously, without command began worshipping on Sunday, the first day of the week. This would have been an incredible change for the Jewish believers. I mean, imagine, imagine if we tried to say, okay, we're going to have church on Monday next week. It would be the weirdest thing. It would be the weirdest thing. How, how could we do that? I mean, how we rearrange our schedule? Couldn't do it. Well, the early church did. They did. They worshipped the first day of the week. Justin Martyr of the second century said that on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets, Old New Testament, are read as long as time permits. Bless him not having a clock or a phone. Sunday is the day in which Marta said, hold our common assembly because Jesus Christ, our Saviour, on the same day rose from the dead. It was a weekly celebration of his resurrection. If we have a Saviour who died and rose again, that is worth remembering. It's worth remembering because it means that we're saved. It means that there's victory over death, hell and the grave. So if someone says to you, look, why do you go to church on Sunday? Say, well, it's about the resurrection. That's what it's about. It's about the fact that Jesus died, he rose again, bodily, bodily, and he secured the payment for my sins. How important is worshipping the resurrected Christ? Can't put a value on it, friends. How much is is worshipping a dead God worth? Nothing. A resurrected Christ Everything. Everything. It's worth every other alternative. Every other alternative. Worshipping our resurrected Christ is better than everything else combined. Combined. That's why we come to church. It's to give our resurrected Christ glory. That's why. To encourage others to worship him. The Puritans called Sunday the market day of the soul. That's when our soul gets to feed leisurely. To have time for friends and family. It's to have time for the afternoon Sunday nap. Amen. Amen. I mean, is it not a proof of salvation sometimes, I think? That whole Sunday afternoon nap? At least for those that are preaching Sunday morning. Let us honour the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. Number five. Number five today is this. 
the singular importance of honouring our parents. Look at 12. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You know, in uh, Elsa in, in, in Moses, it talks about honouring mother and father. The order switched. It switched. So it's not, you know, you've got to really honour your dad, but mum, well, it's optional. In fact, fathers should say, okay, kids, if, if, if I've told you to do something, that also means do not go to mum. Okay, the, sh- sh- don't bother, she'll give you the same answer. Something like that. That'll work. Try it. She'll just say the same thing as me. Okay, honouring our parents. Uh, Jews place this command on the first table. They regarded that as in connection with our relationship to God. The word is honour. It doesn't just say obey, because let's face it, you, you can, you, we've, all, we've all obeyed without honouring, right? We've all obeyed without really respecting two different things. But the honouring deals with the attitude, the attitude. Uh, when we talked about the Ten Commandments in Sunday School this morning, we talked about how the commandments deal with categories of behavior, categories, because when it says to honor our parents, we're helping children to grow up and to give honor to others, to others. They honor their school teachers. They honor their employers. They honor the police, the government. All right. They're categories of honouring. All right. I mean, don't you pity the, the son that, 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 that will not obey and, and then he goes and joins the army. Joins the army. And there's a drill sergeant just licking his chops, waiting for this, for this kid to come and sign up. And what he thought was oppressive at home was like a party. It was easy, but all of a sudden he signed up for the military. Yes, yes. You can learn early or later. Early or later. As their children get older, they have additional relationships that they've got to manage. Teachers and employers and church leaders, they've got to, they get married and they have relationships. And they have to be prioritized and managed. Managed. But if they don't manage the first relationship first, if they don't get the honouring of parents first, then often those other relationships become very hard. Very hard. You get a person that's never learned to submit. They've never learned to follow. And, 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 they, and they marry someone? <laughs> and that person's just as selfish as them? This is a recipe for disaster, friends, unless something really changes. So if we won't obey the first authority God's put over us, then it's much harder to obey the others, the others, honouring parents. And I know that things change as we get older. It's a different kind of obedience. It's a different kind of honouring. We never stop honouring them, though we're out, out of the home or married or we have our own independence there's an honoring that takes place and even even where there is estrangement even where there has been maybe a father abusing children things like that uh, one one writer said look the way that you honor is by is by not dishonoring it may mean saying nothing honor by not dishonoring but this is in the word of God. And we, and we need to take this very, very seriously. I have two, two observations left. Number six, the, the commandments expose human depravity. Human depravity. Look at, verse, look at verse 13, don't murder. 14, don't commit adultery. 15, don't steal. 16, don't bear false witness. 17, don't covet what doesn't belong to you. Do we have to be reminded about these things? 
Is it really necessary for God to spell all this out? Yes, it is. It is. The last commandment deals with not coveting. Just, just don't desire the wrong things. Don't even do that. Now this is a unique command because this, this wasn't in the other pagan religious laws and obligations. They, it was all about behavior. This last commandment says don't even want to do the wrong thing. You know, Paul says in Romans 7 that it was this last commandment that convicted him of sin. Don't covet. You see, he thought he'd done everything else. But he knew in his own heart he wanted his own sinful way. Don't even covet. Actually, actually, if we focused on the last commandment, don't covet, you wouldn't go anywhere near to breaking the other commandments that are there listed. The commandments expose not how good we are, but how bad we are, friends. The Ten Commandments are, spell the end to human righteousness. The commandments tell us that all is not right inside our hearts. That we need God and his grace. And then last point today, last point, the law of God drives us. The Ten Commandments drive us to the cross. And I would remind you, verse 2 of Exodus 20, where God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Think about the scriptures we read from Matthew 19. This rich young ruler comes to Christ and he's brimming with confidence. What do I need to do? And Jesus refers him to the commandments relating to man. Man, his neighbor, and he'd done all those things. He said, well, just sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. You see, this rich young ruler had a covetous heart. He put his money before his worship of God. And he needed to repent of that. If only we could keep it perfectly. I mean, I'd be happy just to do this perfectly for just, just a few weeks. That'd be progress. That'd be progress. I mean, we need someone who could do this for us. That's what we need. If only there was someone who could, who could actually live this day in, day out, and, and somehow the merit that he had and the righteousness he had could somehow come to me and you. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus lived the way God intended you and I to live. He responded to every trial, every temptation that God sent his way. His every motivation to every circumstances of life, please God, even in his desires, he did what was right. In other words, Jesus did what we could never do for ourselves. That's what he did. Jesus, the second Adam, the second Adam passed the test that our first father and mother failed. To keep God's law. To keep God's law. And so when we look at the Ten Commandments, we, we see our undoing, our undoing, but we also see our need for God's grace and God's help. But Paul says in Galatians that the law was, was like a tutor, a schoolmaster, to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. then set free in Christ to obey his commandments. The, the law is not a means of life, it is a way of life. It's a way of life. Proverbs 29.18 says that where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is he who keeps the law. A happy, fulfilled life comes. It comes from obedience to God. We can't do it ourselves. It has to come from God's strength, his grace. Knowing that there was a man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. Paul says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He, he has become our righteousness. 
and our hope. I wonder if you're here today, you haven't put your faith and trust in him. You need to do it today. Today. You need to put your faith in him today. Otherwise, you'll, ha- you'll have no hope of heaven and you'll have no hope of keeping God's commands. He'll help you do that, to walk with him.